ครับสบอ่าสวัสดีครับอ่าครั้งนี้ก็เป็นการสัมมนาอีกครั้งหนึ่งนะครับของโครงการไกลกลาของเรานะครับวันนี้เราก็พูดเรื่องศาสนาในเมืองจีนโดยร่วมกับทางสารเจ้าแม่รับทีมสะพานเหลืองนะครับก่อนอื่นผมอยากจะให้พวกเราทุกคนในที่นี้ได้รู้จักนะครับว่าสารเจ้าแม่ทับทีมสะพานเหลืองอ,อยู่ที่ไหนแล้วก็ตอนนี้เป็นยังไงบ้างนะครับวันนี้เรามีคณะกรรมการสารเจ้าแม่ทับทีมสะพานเหลืองอยู่กับเราด้วยนะครับเชิญครับสวัสดีครับผมชื่อนริศิริชวนิตนะครับก็เป็นคณะกรรมการของสารเจ้าแม่ทับทีมสะพานเหลืองครับสารเจ้าแม่ทับทีมสะพานเหลืองนะครับก็เป็นสารเจ้าเก่าแก่ที่มีประวัติความเป็นมาตั้งแต่สมัยรัชกาลที่5นะครับเป็นสารเจ้าที่มีความสําคัญแล้วก็เป็นที่นับถือของผู้คนในแถบส่วนหลวงสัมย่านโดยเป็นสารเจ้าของอเทวนารีแห่งท้องทะเลนะครับที่ในภาษาจีนกลางก็จะเรียกว่ามาจูโดยเป็นสารเจ้าที่มีความสําคัญว่าได้รับพระราชทานกระถางทูบจากรัชกาลที่6นะครับในงานพระบรมศพรัชกาลที่5เมื่อปี2453และแม้ว่าอาคารหลังปัจจุบันจะมีอายุเพียงแค่50ปีแต่ว่าก็เป็นแหล่งรวมศรัทธาความเชื่อแล้วก็เป็นสถาปัตยกรรมแบบแท้จริงนะครับที่ครบถ้วนสมบูรณ์ควรค่าแก่การอนุรักษ์ไว้ครับ And uh, for our English speaking audience so first off we would like to give a short introduction of the t a p t e n Goddess Shrine at which at the city here is a shrine committee member um, The t a p t e n Goddess Shrine is a centuries year, uh, year old place of worship for m a h a t u which is the sea goddess Which has its roots from the reign of King Rama V, and also having received a uh, joustic vessel as an offering from King Rama VI in 1910 as well. And on top of the shrine's importance uh, to the local residents of Samyan and Sunwang, it also boasts traditional uh, Shao Shan architectural aspects, despite having relocated from a nearby area around 50 years ago. It is more than prudent for a shrine to be recognized as a cultural heritage. โอเคนะครับเดี๋ยวขอเริ่มเลยเนาะ Hello I'm n a t i v i t Chodipat Pai San I'm a president of political science student union of j u l a l u n g k o r University uh, Throughout this year our political science student union will have uh, will invite speakers around the world to talk about um, various issues that we as a global citizen have to face now today uh, Today we have uh, Ian Johnson uh, who is the uh, Contributor, regular contributor to New York Times, New York Reviews of Books. He writes about uh, civil society, religions, and politics in China, and uh, lived there for 20 years. He won a Pulitzer Prize, and his uh, recent book is uh, "The Soul of China: uh, The Return of Religion After Mao," which I think uh, it's very interesting uh, to talk about today. So. Uh, I would like to to ask Ian uh, for uh, your book. I think many many people might not uh, might not know your book, but I think it's uh, very interesting, and I want you to present uh, the over, overview of uh, uh, the soul of China for us. And to discuss this topic. Um, I think it's very um, interesting that we're discussing this in the context of a of a shrine of a temple to Mazu because this is um, one of the uh, goddesses who uh, plays quite an interesting role in the return of religion and in the contemporary issues around religion in China. So um, yeah, let me just sort of begin by saying that when people think of religion in China. If they think of it at all, they probably think that there is no religion in China or very little religion in China because uh, China is run by a communist party. Uh, communism is sort of uh, dedicated, uh, supports atheism, and so many people might think, "Oh, well, then there can be no religion in China, or if there is religion." Maybe it's just underground, very minor, um, and that it doesn't play a big role in society. But I think this impression is wrong uh, because China is in the midst of a large religious revival that began several decades ago. Um, 
and continues today. Um, I think it's, there are, of course, and I'll, I'll mention this later, there are many signs of a uh, crackdown on religion in China or tight government control over religion. However, it's still true that religion is growing, um, especially the so-called traditional religions, Buddhism, Taoism, folk religious uh, beliefs as well. And I think it's hard to miss that if you travel to China. Uh, there are many new uh, churches that have been built. Um, there's been crackdown on Christianity and on Islam as well. But overall, there are more and more people engaged in religious life. And whether you support it or don't support it, I think the main thing is that faith and values are returning to the center of a national discussion in China over how to organize Chinese life and what are the values of China. I think for many, many Chinese, they are uh, concerned about their society and are turning to religion and faith to answer some of these questions. Um, just two days ago, for example, there was a video um, that was widely circulated in Chinese um, social media that showed a man murdering his wife in the street. And people just walked by and nobody did anything about this. And the video was, of course, terrible. Uh, it went viral. Uh, why did it go viral? Because people were concerned that nobody did anything. So they say, why, what's wrong with our society? Why do people not try to stop a murder happening in front of them? Um, and of course, that's something that we find in many countries around the world today. Uh, issues about faith and values are very important. In the most recent, the ongoing presidential campaign in the United States, issues of values, religion, faith play a central role. And we see that in many, many countries around the world. But um, I think in China, this has be become very important, uh, not just in the, say, the ethnic minority areas. We know that in some border regions of China, such as Xinjiang, Islam is quite popular, or in Tibet, uh, Buddhism, Tibetan Buddhism is quite popular. I think people know that already. But what's really interesting is that the heartland of China, which you could roughly say is, you know, Beijing in the north, down to Guangzhou, Shanghai on one coast, all the way into Chengdu in Sichuan, that this is really where there is a major religious revival going on. Um, exactly how many people are engaged in religious activities is hard to know. Uh, there's no good uh, survey work done on this. Uh, but uh, if you look at almost any survey, any uh, sociological work, you can see that the number of people going to temples is increasing. The number of temples is being uh, is being re is, is increasing. The number of temples are being built. Um, and overall in China, you have a big discussion over what makes us happy, why or what makes a society moral? Um, how should we live our lives? Uh, you know, in China, there's a lot of prosperity, but there's even as China gets more and more pros prosperous, uh, there is more interest in religion. So if you think of the classic modernization theory, people would say, oh, as society gets richer, interest in religion goes down. But that's actually not true in many countries in the world and certainly not true in China, because as Chinese people have gotten more prosperous, interest in religion has also increased because I think people realize that after they've satisfied their material needs, there are still other ideas, other concerns, um, such as how to live a good life. What is a good life? What really makes you a, a happy person? Uh, and these are issues that are hard to be solved with just material answers. And so many people, as in countries around the world, are turning to religion. So why do I say return of religion? Um, I think it's important to understand that 
China over the past roughly 150 years has been in uh, an anti-religious secularizing uh, trend that started in the late 19th century because of a series of crises that beset China, starting, you could say, with the Opium War, uh, but especially as the 19th century went on, the 1840s, 1850s, 1860s, 70s, 80s, there were more and more crises that affected China. Initially, Chinese leaders, civil servants, intellectuals thought, oh, the problem is just that we lack military hardware or we lack maybe some science and so on. But as the 19th century went on and China was still being attacked, could not fight off, especially the Western countries that were curving it up into colonies, people began to question Chinese culture itself. And there was a, uh, a major attack on Chinese traditional culture, especially traditional religious beliefs. And you may say, why religion? Why couldn't China just change its economic structure, change its political structure? Why also attack religion? And I think the reason for that is because in traditional China, religion and politics were inseparable. They were very, very tightly together. And so if you were attacking the power structure, you were also attacking the religious structure in China. The emperor of China was considered to be a son of heaven. The officials in China didn't just carry out uh, tax policy or something like that. They also carried out religious rituals. They also presided over ceremonies and temples. The entire political structure was really a political religious structure in China. Temples were called by one scholar of the historian Prasenjit Duara. He calls temples the nexus of power, the center of power in traditional China. So when people wanted to change the political structure to stand up to the West, they also attacked religion in China. Starting in the late 19th century, there was already a movement in 1898 to convert temples into schools. The idea that we need more schools, less religion, that there was a contradiction between these two things. Nowadays, we may find that strange, but this was a firm belief of, an, of more and more elites in China at the top of the power structure. Um, you think of the person who over, helped overthrow the last dynasty, the Qing dynasty, Sun Yat-sen. Um, one of his first acts of rebellion as a young man was to go to the local temple uh, in his hometown with a big stick and destroy the statues in the temple. Uh, this is a temple to Janu, the perfected warrior. Um, so a very important Taoist deity uh, because he thought that this is what's holding China back. It's this idea that traditional Chinese religions were superstitious, that they were not modern. Uh, and that anything that was not following the model of Christianity was backward. So very early on in the Republic of China, you had very many people, including Sun Yat-sen, who were Christian. The idea that Christianity was sort of okay, but that Buddhism, Taoism, folk religion were considered backward. So this is earlier than the communists. It has nothing really to do with the communists. It's part of this modernization theory that was quite popular, not just in China, but in many countries around the world. When the Ottoman Empire collapsed in, um, at the end of World War I, the new Turkish government got rid of the Muslim caliphate. And many sociologists in the West also had this theory that as society, quote unquote, progressed, that religion would become less and less important. Um, so this was um, a trend we found around the world was just very, very strong in China. The communists took power in 1949 and were just the most, uh, you could say the most radical of the reformers who wanted to change China. So they continued the policy of their predecessors, but just with more force and more vigor 
and they really uh, then tried to control religion. They only recognized five religious groups in China. You had Buddhism, Taoism, Islam, and then for administrative purposes in China, Christianity was divided into Protestantism and Catholicism. So those, those five religious groups, Buddhism, Taoism, Islam, Catholicism, Protestantism, the only accepted religions in China. That's still the case today. Um, and then this implied that the vast majority of religious life in China, which did not fit neatly into Buddhism or Taoism, became defined as superstitious. And that would include temples such as to Mazu, or to the god of wealth, or to the earth god, the Tudi Gong, uh, to many uh, famous mountains and uh, ancestor worship, uh, shrines to families, you know, like the, the Li family or the Wang family have their own shrine. Those were considered superstitious. So there was a huge wave of destruction. It began before the communists took power, but really picked up pace um, after 1949. And the culmination was in the Cultural Revolution from 1966 to 1976, when there was basically no religious life allowed and only, uh, only the sort of worship of Chairman Mao was allowed. He was like a kind of god. Um, and of course, Mao died in 1976. And then in 1978, Deng Xiaoping took power and began a new era uh, called the Reform Era. Um, and um, that era is sort of the era we're still in. Uh, and the controls over religion were relaxed so that there was, uh, temples were allowed to reopen, churches and mosques reopened, um, clergy was trained again. The Communist Party did not really support religion, but it was no longer opposing religion. And the overall feeling at that time in the 1980s was that, well, religion is something that we don't really support, but we think it will die out naturally. We're still communists. We still believe that religion will die out, but it will die out slowly. Um, and this is reflected in the most important document from that era, document 19 from 1982, which describes religion in China as a relic of the old society. And so there's this idea that the Mao era was too radical, we'll just let this die naturally. But what happened instead was that religion really took off in the 1980s and 90s. Um, churches were rebuilt, temples were rebuilt. Uh, you can look at this when you go to China, many, many temples were rebuilt and, re and date this to the 1980s. So what you see today in China, this huge, uh, number of temples, so many of them were rebuilt or expanded massively after the 1980s, especially as Chinese people got more and more prosperous, they began to uh, donate more money to temples. And this is quite clear when you go to a temple in China, you can look at the Gongde Bay, these steles that list who donated money. You can see a lot of money being donated in this period of time. Um, I, I think this was this continued on up until roughly mm, five years ago. Then the government came out with a new series of laws on religion, which limits or more tightly controls religious life. So there's still the five acceptable religions, but many of the, so I think there's two sides to it. One side is Christianity and Islam are more tightly controlled than before. Uh, this is because they are still seen as foreign religions and they have a strong foreign component where there is a strong maybe overseas aspect to the religion. The government does not like this. They uh, want religions in China to be indigenous. They don't want religions to have outside interference. So um, this uh, these two religions have had more trouble over the past few years, but the other two religions, Buddhism 
and Taoism have been, I don't want to say directly supported, but given more freedom than in the past. And also quite interesting, these folk religious practices, uh, for example, Mazu or Guangong, uh, the uh, Cai Shan, many of these things have been redefined as what is known as intangible cultural heritage. So, you know, this is a term from the United Nations, intangible cultural heritage is not a building, it's not like the Great Wall of China or the Forbidden City, but it's a practice, it's ritual, it can be music, it doesn't have to be religious, it could also be cuisine, it could be drama, it could be a kind of secular music. But many of these are things that used to be called superstitious. Uh, so there are pilgrimages to holy mountains that now get government support as intangible cultural heritage. There are groups that call pilgrimage associations that organize pilgrimages. Uh, these pilgrimage associations called xianghui, uh, incense, it literally means uh, incense societies, these xianghui. Uh, also, some of them get government subsidies to go on the uh, pilgrimages. Uh, many of the practices, the rituals, the music um, gets government subsidies also. And so overall, we see the government, I think, recognizing that Chinese people have a need for a deeper spiritual life. Uh, they need to have more religious um, life, but that they want to keep still control over it. And I think that this is an effort also maybe to try to encourage people to follow the traditional religious practices and not to make illegal uh, Christianity and Islam, but try to maybe more tightly control it um, and to limit its growth. I think the reason for that, there's, there's many different reasons. One reason in terms of Christianity is that Protestantism was probably in the 80s and 90s and 2000s was probably the fastest growing religion in China. The number of Christians, uh, Protestant Christians increased very, very rapidly, especially among urban educated people, college graduates. And I think that this uh, concerned the government that, that, that many, many people were turning to Protestantism. And so there was this feeling that things were getting out of control. Um, and, and, and so this partly increased the uh, desire to control that. Um, so overall, I think the picture is, is probably mixed in, in, in China today. There is a huge religious revival. And in my book, I try to describe this by looking at five different groups. Um, I talk about folk religious practitioners in Beijing, uh, Taoists in uh, in, in Shenxi province in the countryside, a Protestant group, um, some Buddhist inspired groups as well, and then also the government. And I look at why the government's policy has changed and what the government's interest in these uh, issues are. So these are, that's sort of the structure of my book. I uh, spent a number of years researching and writing it. Um, it's been published in a few languages. Unfortunately, I don't think it's been translated into Thai yet, but maybe you can translate it. Um, but it's been translated in, into, into Chinese. Um, Japanese and Korean editions are on the way and, um, and a couple of others as well. Um, so it, it's a project that I've been interested in personally for a long time. I've, I worked uh, at a religious NGO in the 1990s helping to rebuild temples in China. It's a topic I think is important. Uh, it's still, it's something that I think people don't quite understand. There's a lot of misunderstandings about religion in China. And so it's a topic that's been very close to my heart for the past 20 or so years of living in China. And well, okay, so I think that's sort of a basic introduction. Uh, maybe we can, I can stop there and then you can ask me your questions and I'd be happy to answer them. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Ian Johnson. Um, uh, I would like to ask you about, I want you to explain a little bit more about the concept of uh, religions uh, between uh, Western and China, which I, I think, uh, as you said before. Uh, but before you answer, I would like uh, 
uh, to introduce uh, again to our professor Vasana Wong uh, which uh, she will be our moderator. Also, she is the associate professor of Chinese history of Chulalongkorn University. Her recent book is The Crowd and the Capitalist, uh, which study about the ethnic Chinese and the founding uh, of the Thai nation. Thank you, Professor. Okay, so I get to ask the first question. Thank, yeah, you. Please. thank you very much. This is, thank you very much. It's, it's very, very, what should I say? It's very, it, it's such a coincidence, I feel, that I just, I actually just like wrote a, a, a small research paper in an area relating to this. And then I, today I sort of feel like I should have read your book uh, before getting into that paper. Uh, so I, maybe I, I would need to go to the basics a bit. Uh, and perhaps you, you can elaborate a, a bit about what exactly is considered Chinese religion, right? I think I, I totally agree with you that uh, the issue of Chinese religion is, is kind of like, it's, it's, it's something that gets people debating a lot, like you said earlier in your presentation, that some people say China doesn't even have a religion after all. No, I uh, and then, yeah, yeah, which which I think, I think I disagree and, and you disagree. So we, we, we all disagree. We, we think China has a religion, but then China has religions even, right? Uh, and then it's, it's interesting that uh, after the Cultural Revolution ended, then the, the, the reform government says, okay, we allow five religions. Uh, and you said there's Buddhism, Taoism, and Christianity was divided into Catholicism, Protestantism, and Islam, right? And the rest is Nishin, right? Like superstition. Uh, mm -hmm. And the, the first thing I... I uh, the first thing that came to my mind after encountering these, this categorization uh, is that how interesting the one, like, well, the, one of the most major, you know, uh, native Chinese uh, philosophy is not considered a religion. Uh, Confucianism, mm. right? Confucianism is not Confucianism. in there. Yeah. Uh, but then at the same time, Confucius has been employed until recently as the greatest uh, soft power uh, presenter of China, right, through the Confucius Institute and this. So, so there's, there's a period that, that obviously the Chinese Communist government isn't against Confucianism. And then, and then later on, you, you did explain that uh, this idea that ancestral worship uh, would be considered uh, uh, what intangible cultural cultural heritage, right? And and kind of mm -hmm. tied to uh, maybe this idea of Confucianism as a as a philosophy, or maybe just like parts of Chinese culture itself that could be kind of presented to the world and encourage tourism and all that. Uh, and I guess my question is, and, and, and then you also touch on uh, the sort of the, the, the categorization of native religions and foreign religions, right? And then he, here, is, here is my very long-winded question. Uh, uh, when there is a tendency, I feel there is a tendency in China that uh, whenever they adopt even foreign ideas or foreign culture or foreign religion into China, it becomes sinified somehow. And I mean, even in the pre-modern era with the uh, bringing Buddhism into China, uh, you see the emergence of, of a lot of folk 
I, I, I call them folk religious movement, which I'm, I'm not exactly sure if it's the correct term. But then some people would say there's these syncretic religious movements as well, the mixture between Buddhism, Taoism, Confucianism, and, and then there's like this folk religion that comes up. And a lot of times, a lot of times, these folk religions then uh, then become sectarian movements or millenarian uh, movements that that could lead to uh, rebellions and such. Uh, so, and you did mention that something like uh, uh, Protestantism has proliferated quite a lot in the in the Chinese countryside and uh, and 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 other religions that, that might be considered part of these five uh, state sanctioned uh, religions as well. So I guess uh, my question is how does the how does these like syncretic religious movements or these like folk religious or you might call signified uh, organized religion uh, fit into this, to your narrative? Like, I guess what's on the tip of my lip and I have tried not to say a long time, it's like something like, like the Qigong movement or the Falun Gong, for example, uh, or because you, you see some of these mm -hmm. groups coming, getting into trouble with the Chinese government, uh, but not all of them. Uh, like mm. like Qigong is okay, but Falun Gong is not okay, right? So mm. so where do these movements uh, fit in to the in the spectrum of religion Narrative. versus right? Uh, yes, versus superstition, and how does how do they get along or not get along with the with the Chinese government at, at the moment? And, and of course, in, yeah, in your, um, the, the soul of the nation. Yeah, I mean, I think those, those, those are great questions. And I think I mean, one thing is what you're getting at, I think one of the questions you were getting at, I think is, uh, you know, what, how do you define Chinese religion? Um, and that's a very difficult question. I mean, some some Chinese will say, uh, we don't have religion, you know, so like, and they'll sort of say, oh, because, uh, you know, uh, they, they will use Christianity as a norm for what a religious practice is. I think, I think the thing about religion in China is people have, have, have dealt with this and tried to deal with this in the past. And they've often said uh, the best term maybe in the past was Chinese religion. And that this is sort of an amalgam, because if you looked at traditional China, there were very few temples. Like, say there were, you know, maybe just one percent of temples, or or five percent of temples, maybe a little bit more, would say, "Oh, we're one hundred percent Buddhist." The others would say, "We're one hundred percent Taoist." I mean, if you went to most people in China nowadays, we're kind of used to asking people, "Are you Buddhist? Are you Taoist? Are you Christian? Are you Muslim?" And you sort of say, "I'm this or I'm that." But in traditional China, people didn't have that concept. It was just considered in your village, there would be at least one temple, but there were offer, often several temples and you would just go worship there. And you didn't, it wasn't like you said, oh, I'm a Taoist because I've read the Tao Te Ching by Lao Tzu and I've read this and I've read that and I believe in this, 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 and this, and that makes me a Taoist or something. Um, Buddhism was a little more clearly defined because it came from India and it had a more clearly definable series of beliefs. but many people in china would have absolutely and still today have no there's no contradiction in going to one temple or another um so this is you know in in the abrahamic religions of judaism christianity and islam you can't sort of say oh i'm uh going to celebrate this holiday but i'm also going to go on the hajj or something like that you do one or the other you're either a muslim or a christian or a jew you can't sort of mix them all together um, whereas I think in traditional China, that was not really the case. Um, and, and some, somebody once said it's like one mountain with three paths going to the top, or it's like one giant plateau. And on top of the plateau are three small peaks. 
uh, Buddhism, Taoism, and Confucianism. Um, and then this is a side answer to your other question, what happened to Confucianism? Confucianism, when these religions were organizing, they didn't just start to organize after the communists took power, they began to organize under the Republic of China in the 1920s. And so the Republic of China, as a modern bureaucratic state, it was like, we need to talk to these groups in society. So there is no church in Buddhism, there is no, or traditionally there was no church type structure. You know, there's no Pope at the top, right? And there's no Pope at the top of Taoism. Um, and so how do you organize these structures? Um, so the Taoists and the Buddhists organized national structures, committees uh, to sort of represent their interests. The Confucians tried to, um, but I think they were too closely aligned with the old state the old imperial bureaucracy. In fact, one major Chinese reformer from the late 19th and early 20th century, Kang Yo Wei, Kang Yo Wei, one of his ideas was to make Confucianism the national religion of China, like Shintoism in Japan. He said, every religion, every, every country needs a national religion. And he looked around the world, he said, it's not like there's no religion in the West. The West has its religions. They just define it like in England, it's the Church of England, right? The queen is at the top of the Church of England. So let's have something like that in China. We need something for people to believe in, uh, but that didn't pass. And then, so eventually Confucianism became sort of redefined as just a philosophy um, or some belief system. But clearly, if you go to Chinese cities, there are Confucius temples and it was, um, and in many, many temples, there's a shrine to Confucius where people often go and pray if, before uh, taking college entrance examinations and, and things like that. So, you know, clearly Confucianism was a belief system um, and it just became, did not sort of make it for this process of modernization in the 20th century as a separate religion. Um, I think these terms, these terms, Zongjia, religion, and superstition, mishin. These are new terms. These are new words that were imported from Japan in the late 19th century to define this sociological phenomenon. Because in the past, people didn't really think of it like that. They just thought there were some, there were things that people believed in and did. And the government would sometimes say, this is uh, okay, it's jung. So it's kind of, uh, uh, yeah, okay, jung and then xie. And xie is um, so orthodox and unorthodox, which is now xie, like xie jiao, like cult. It's the same, the same character. So the imperial system, but the imperial system didn't really get interested that much. There was so much going on at the grassroots, just like in any traditional society compared to a modern bureaucratic state. Most of society was not controlled by the government in the old, in the old system. So they just got down to the county level. They had no idea really what was going on in the village level. So the government wasn't so involved in that, but as, as the modern bureaucratic state was formed in the 20th century, they began to, oh, how do we define this? And then they kind of used the Christian norm that if you have um, a certain set of beliefs, you worship in a certain place, certain day of the week, um, a professional clergy, then that's okay. That can be defined as, an, as a real, quote unquote, a real religion. And then other things are then considered to be superstitious. And so that's why, these groups became so many things in China didn't fit neatly into that scheme. Today, I think the government almost never uses that term superstition. You almost never see it in media. Uh, they don't really talk about it um, occasionally, but it's almost never. Like in the 80s and 90s, when I was in China, the government was constantly saying, oh, this is superstition. This is machine. That's machine fortune telling. That's machine and so on and so forth. But nowadays, well, there are fortune telling places all around the cities. You can get your palm you know, red, your face red, all kinds of things like that. Uh, people don't say it's religion. They just say it's traditional culture. You know, so they just say oh, it's just Wenhua. So it's a clever way of redefining religion as culture. Then you just get away from the whole religion thing, which is controversial, and you just say it's culture. Um, and then that way everybody can just go, oh yeah, yeah, it's culture, then fine, go ahead and do it. And so you know, you go to a temple and there's there's one temple that I researched run by a Communist Party member. 
But whenever the temple opens and so on, he has incense. He goes and kotos before the statue. And I said, uh, aren't you a Communist Party member? He says, oh, this is not religion. This is just uh, traditional culture. I'm like, okay, so it's traditional culture. They call it what you want. I don't care. Uh, so I think that's how they deal with it. The government is in some ways quite pragmatic about this and just says, hey, just just call it culture and just forget about it. So, so only the ones that become social movements or have too many members or become too influential right. would then get in trouble with the government. Yes, I think that's a great point. Let's go back to your question. So why did some groups like Falun Gong get in trouble? I think the problem there was that Falun Gong got, was very well organized and had a national movement. It was making political demands um, and that this was um, the government felt correctly or incorrectly. I don't know. Um, but they felt that this was a political challenge and that they had to crack down on it. Um, and so that was why it's, it's the same with NGOs in China. If you just want to set up a little NGO in your hometown to clean up a river, uh, that's okay. But if you try to set up a national NGO to clean up all the rivers in China and try to lobby the government, then it's a problem. So local small scale religious organizations are okay. Even even a house church, even if it's not officially recognized, just a small church or something like that, if it's it's okay. But if you try to set up a big church um, and a, net, a network of unregistered churches, then that's not okay. So that's the same principle. Or even the idea of like something like Catholicism that uh, that has a network with like you know, with the Vatican and, and all of that, which is also not okay, <laughs> therefore. So, so long as the network is managed by the state, then that is, we're good. Basically. Yes. Right? That's, and that's the challenge of, of, uh, of Abraham, of, of, of Islam and Christianity or the over, overseas ties. And so, of course, we've seen recently, there's been a lot in the news about the Vatican and Beijing with, um, having an agreement, it was just renewed by the Vatican, um, and quite you know controversial about trying to reach an arrangement with Beijing over appointing bishops, uh, and and so the problem there is that they, the government did not have any relations cut or the diplomatic relations were cut um, in the 1950s, and so now the question is can they reestablish this? But that's a very very sensitive issue. Probably will take many many years to be resolved. I guess. Okay, I have, I have one one question. It's about, uh, about Tap Team Goddess tried uh, about Mazu. Uh, 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 so Mazuism, which is the worship of Mazu, uh, the sea goddess, is a traditional belief in China, which is, well, it's not directly related to Buddhism or Taoism. Uh, nevertheless, what reasons are behind the CCP's, well, supportive actions towards this seemingly non-conventional belief? Because you know, as seen from statues of uh, the goddess being flown to Asian countries, especially to uh, areas where Mazuism is practiced, such as Thailand and Singapore. So would you consider this a, a diplomatic campaign or does it have to do with the spread, uh, as, as you said, with the proliferation of culture or uh, how would you take this, um, this action from this, uh, the, the Chinese government? Um. Yeah, I know. I think Mazu is a great, it's a very interesting case because Mazu was um, originally considered to be superstitious. Uh, there were campaigns against Mazu and, and these kinds of 
uh, deities that did not fit neatly into Buddhism or Taoism uh, in the Mao era. And then in the 1980s, uh, Mazu came back uh, and, and in some ways it is, of course, used as a diplomatic tool uh, with Taiwan, uh, of course, especially because you have um, a, a big, Mazu is a very, very important deity in Taiwan. Um, and, and you have Mazu festivals celebrated a lot in Fujian, which is just across the Taiwan Straits. But wherever there are overseas Chinese communities, especially since Mazu is related to the sea, seafaring, the ocean. So people who traveled overseas were often from that part of the country where Mazu was very popular and brought Mazu to, uh, yes, as you said, Singapore, Thailand, Malaysia. Um, and so I think the CCP sees it as a useful diplomatic tool to show that, hey, we're um, we're the home country, you know, come and do business here. We welcome you. Um, we're not scary or something like that. Uh, so I think it's, it's, it's useful in that. And it, just to, to show the ties that link the countries together, um, a kind of soft power, um, which is quite common. Many countries, I think, do this um, in terms of religion. Um, and so that's, but, I, but it's also come back now as intangible cultural heritage inside China. And Mazu is, the, the funny thing about intangible cultural heritage is there's many levels, you know, China is very bureaucratic. So they have national level intangible cultural heritage and then provincial level and then county level and village levels so that are going from top to bottom. And so Mazu is national level intangible cultural heritage. So it gets very high status. Um, and you see Mazu temples uh, rebuilt and, 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 the, and, and are quite, get quite a lot of government support in China. Thank you. Um, I, I would like to ask you about um, as uh, COVID-19 has uh, come to affect many people's lives. And I wonder uh, uh, the civil society, religious uh, society, what uh, the role they play in China in helping this? Oh yeah, that's a great question. Well, uh, the government always has a, a mixed feeling towards civil society and disasters. Because on the one hand, I think the government wants people to participate, uh, wants people to feel that they are helping out in a national crisis. Uh, on the other hand, the government wants to show that it is solving the problem and it's in control. And so while it's good to have people from society helping out, it's not 100% necessary. <laughs> so it, you know, it's a bit of a contradiction. So it's sort of on the one hand, good you help out. On the other hand, we, can, we have it under control. Don't worry about it. Um, so in the case of COVID though, religious organizations, uh, did play a role. Uh, there were a number, many, many, the Buddhist Association of China, the Taoist Association, many different groups, religious groups, the Islamic Association, they all made donations of money to the relief, uh, to buying equipment and, and things like that. So, and, you know, some of this was political that the the big associations sort of have to, whenever there's a big disaster, a, a flood or something like that, the associations all write a check and then make a big ceremony. Here's the check. Thank you. You, know, you were just helping out. But I think there's also a genuine feeling among people that they wanted to help. That it was a major national catastrophe and that um, and, and they donated through religious organizations. And I think, you know, the big NGOs, the sort of government NGOs, the gongos, like the Chinese Red Cross, the uh, Hope uh, Association, which is another charity organization. Many people feel that these charities are impersonal, that they are maybe inefficient, possibly corrupt. But if they make donation to their local temple, that that is going to be much more useful because they know the people there and they think the money will be, will get to the people who need the help. 
So I saw that in several temples that I know very well that people made a lot of donations, hundreds of thousands of, of dollars, like the equivalent in, in U.S. dollars. So a lot, you know, a lot of money uh, by any standard through temples. And in the end, it was millions of dollars that went to help the affected areas. So you did see civil society and religious organizations involved. Okay, thank you very much. And uh, I think now we have uh, 10 to 15 minutes left. So we will move to Q&A question. So if you have any question, please uh, send to our page and we will uh, ask Ye Johnson. She is from Bangkok, from a long time Italian Bay Jinger. Question for Ian. Over the past few years, I have met quite a few well-educated Chinese that seem to hold a mix of Christian beliefs and folk beliefs, putting together traditional Christian prayers and rites with tarot reading, astrology, and the lights. Most time, these beliefs are meditated by different kind of gurus and fortune tellers. Do you have a perspective over these aspects of the religious revival? Yeah, yeah, no, definitely. One of the groups that I followed in my book uh, was a self-cultivation meditation group that was very popular with middle class, upper middle class people, even wealthy people. Uh, I think you find this situation in many countries around the world where people will sometimes say, oh, I'm interested in spiritual questions, but I'm not interested in religion, you know, because religion is considered to be too organized, too hierarchical. And so they like to uh, sort of mix and match, you know, choose. It's like they're in a cafeteria of religions. I think a little bit of this, a little bit of that, go down and add this all together, and that becomes their spiritual life. So you definitely do see that uh, in China as well. P personal salvation, you know, people looking for their own gurus, uh, sometimes one of the more popular ones, for example, is Tibetan Buddhism. There are many Han Chinese who have personal Tibetan Buddhist uh, holy figures, Rim Rinpoches, who come to Beijing or Shanghai and have workshops and classes and can charge quite a bit of money to do things like that. And sometimes, sometimes it's not as well sort of defined. A friend of mine, for example, was uh, wanted more you know, peace and calm in her life. She joined this uh, fasting group and they would go to um, a hotel on the outskirts of Shanghai and you go there every weekend if you want. You have to pay some money and you can go there. And there would be a Buddhist um, you know, monk who, who, had, um, who would offer some advice and stuff like that. Mainly people just fasted uh prayed it wasn't so it wasn't in a temple it was in a hotel you couldn't really say it was a hundred percent religious you know but there was also a buddhist monk who was involved in this um and they would maybe take calligraphy lessons write calligraphy um so so that you could say it was cultural but maybe the calligraphy they were writing was a sutra a buddhist sutra so you know you're at this calligraphy class you're writing out buddhist calligraphy but you can't really say it's not in a temple it's not a formal religious uh training or, or something like that or practice it's not not a formal ritual i think there's a lot of that that goes on in china just as in other countries around the world so Okay, thank you. Um, so if you have any question, you can send to our page. Okay. So maybe I would like to ask uh, you, Ian, uh, about um, the very current uh, situation now, as uh, I think you have been affected by uh, the policy, the China uh, and US war. So I think uh, maybe we can have a more bright uh, future. 
for for after after the the results of this election u.s election oh yeah the u.s election well i think um i guess it looks like biden will probably win uh, i guess that's the if you had to bet money or, or or predict it would probably be biden uh there's probably there's more chance for a i wouldn't say a bright future i think even before trump took office there was a feeling that china was no longer maybe um, a partner but was more of a rival to the united states i think in washington there was a growing consensus about that uh, not an enemy but maybe a potential rival and i think that this probably won't change entirely um, but i think the, the thing about trump is that trump trump is very unpredictable Uh, a lot of name calling, a lot of very, uh, you know, sort of unusual behavior. Um, that probably will change. You'll have more establishment foreign policy officials uh, who will take charge of foreign policy. But I don't think relations will become as good as they were, say, 10 or, or so years ago. I think there's still, there's too many points of conflict between the United States and, and China in economic, military, you know, Taiwan, uh, China is a rising power and the United States is the established power. And it's uh, very difficult for these two things to not conflict. Uh, I don't, I'm not predicting conflict, but it's very, it takes a lot of diplomatic skill to avoid a conflict. And I think that that's, um, still unsure how that will pl play out even if biden wins okay uh related to that, that and bringing it back to religion a bit uh there's a there seems to be a surge in nationalism maybe or to use the nicer word patriotism or something but kind of like new nationalism being in in china with this like national pride and everything uh with especially with with the the most recent regime of, of xi jinping uh and how how have you seen that affect uh religious movements or religions or faith so far i mean i as a political historian usually think or, or would tend to view nationalism as as a, as a very emotional and spiritual thing as well so i often kind of feel like if there's a rise of nationalism if the state is trying to like promote more nationalism that it might affect uh this aspect of, of people's lives so so how has that worked out so far yeah well nationalism i guess there's many different uh many different strands in china today nationalism is certainly one of them uh the government has promoted a, a very strong vision of china rising in the world retaking its uh, place um, and the glories of Chinese civilization. Uh, religion can be used in, in as part of that, of course. Uh, most directly, the link between the two is the government has tried to, has, has been pushing this concept of indigenizing Chinese religions so that religions all have to, you know, you say, well, how, how do you indigenize? I mean, it's not a theological question or it's not about, it's more having to do with uh, government control over religion uh, that, I mean, small things, but even in say Buddhist or Taoist temples, there's now a uh, flagpole, a uh, flag raising ceremony, not, not every day, but not in every temple, but in, in a lot of the major temples. You know, this isn't unusual in the world. If you look at, say, go back to the Church of England, you know, the flag of the Church of England has the english national flag right built into the flag of the church of england so religion and politics is often very closely entwined in many many cultures i do think that the government is trying to 
make sure that religion is part of its um, drive to modernize China, to make China prosperous, rising in the world. So religion can play a useful role in that, um, but I think that they are also very careful about religion, that they don't want religion to be an independent source of power or authority. Uh, you know, in 19... In the 1980s, in the Soviet bloc, in the Soviet Union, uh, religion played a role in, in helping to undermine communism in Poland. The Catholic Church played an important role. Um, and in East Germany, the Protestant Church played a role by giving an independent space for dissidents. The government knows that, and it doesn't want religious organizations to be like that in today's China. If anything, I think if a, a better model would be to look at Vladimir Putin's Russia, where the Orthodox Church is very closely entwined with the political structure. And Putin, you know, ex-KGB man, all of a sudden now is a religious person, goes to church, he found God, it's a wonderful story, you know, if you believe it. Um, and... Uh, and not that Xi Jinping is not going to start going to temple, right? He doesn't, he, it's still a communist party. He's still atheist. But I think they see the value of religion in helping to guide people. And so, you know, it's not a coincidence that religious organizations are also asked to participate in national symbolism, like having a flag, um, like in putting Xi's picture on the bulletin board in the temples and stuff like that. I mean, it's not it's not totally unusual, but this is new in China. Oh, we have another question from the audience. Um, small question: Why in the book you did not add a picture section? that might have a hill to bring to light even more the characters and the places described. Was it more for privacy reasons? Oh, that's a good question. Uh, well, I always think that writers should write, photographers should take pictures. And most of the time when writers take pictures, they're bad pictures. Um, I could have, I, my my wife is a photographer I, and she took many pictures of, of religious life. I could have added in pictures, but, um, it's better probably um, not to mix the two. I mean, I, I don't know. There's a lot of pictures of religious life. You can go to my website. I have pictures of religious life there also. Um, but there's a convention of not mixing the two. But maybe I should have put some pictures in. I don't know. Yeah. Pictures are can be complicated for publication sometimes. <laughs> I, I know that about my book. My book doesn't have any pictures, but yeah. Yeah, sometimes then, you know, you make color pictures or black and white pictures and then, uh, yeah. So I, I left them out, uh, but yeah, maybe a mistake. Maybe in the future, you know, we'll all be reading books on Kindle and it'll be easy to have high definition uh, photos or like iPad type thing. But in printing, it still adds a whole level of complication in a book to you know, add photo section in the middle or not. Okay, I think uh, we have very intense hour and um, very joy uh, to have you, Ian and Ajahn Rasana, to join our session today. Um, I hope that um, um, we will have a. Uh, uh, Next time, session about your book. I think, uh, uh, please, Ian, to, to, to say about your projects. I, 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 I subscribe to your news, uh, your e letter, and I say you have a lot of projects to do uh, in the future. Please uh, tell our, our Thai audience. Well, I'm working on a, my, my next book is a book on history in China, uh, about the writing and rewriting of history. Uh, there's been a movement in China over the past 20 or 30 years for ordinary people to write history and uh, to try to fill in some of the uh, blank spaces in contemporary history that the government doesn't like to uh, talk about or write. Um, and so I'm, these are sort of underground publications, uh, documentary films, 
things like that. So that's uh, that's my next project. I w- I've been working. Actually, I did all the re- research already while I was in China. So now that I'm living uh, back outside of China, I'm, li- I'm in Singapore right now, talking to you from Singapore. So um, I'll be writing it, and a uh, book will come out in a couple of years, in the earliest. So I still have a lot of writing to do. But that's my next project. <laughs> Yeah, Look, looking forward to it, uh, Ian. Uh, so, uh, thank you very much for today. And uh, uh, next time, our our Beyond Boundaries, we will have Francis Fukuyama to talk about liberal orders with us Thai students. So, uh, everybody can follow in our page. So, thank you very much today. And uh, your new book, thank we you. might have another session. Thank you so much. Yeah. See you. Okay, thank you. It's been yeah. a pleasure being on your show, and thank you. Yeah. Bye. Bye. Bye.